Um, what I'm going to do tonight is try to do a demo, and I say try. Uh, I'm going to try to do a demo that will bridge the gap between abstraction and realism. Criteria that Whitney initially proposed about what is a good shape. And what Whitney said is a, a, a good shape needs to be irregular, unpredictable, and oblique. Oblique meaning that it sits at an angle to the page. It isn't absolutely squared up with the top and the sides of the paper. It's inherently more interesting if it moves through the page at a little bit of an angle. What I've added to that is that it should also exit the page probably three times. So my shape goes off here, it goes off here, and it goes off up here, I guess. Um, and what that does is it divides up the picture plane a little more uh, effectively in terms of the negative shapes. Instead of one white shape in the middle and one negative surround, the negative shape has now been broken into a piece here, a piece here, a piece here. Uh, so instead of two shapes, we, we now have five shapes. And that's inherently better and more interesting than just two. So that's the rationale for going off the page. To define the shape, I've surrounded it with a light value wash. So we have light values, middle values, and dark values. I have selected a light value to go around the outside to back paint behind this white shape, to paint in the negative areas, and as that wash goes in, then the white shape emerges. It's very important that the light values stay very light at this stage. If you want to create luminous whites, surround them with light values. Now sometimes we think if you want to get a, a luminous white, surround it with a very dark dark and go for contrast. Um, that will make impact, but it doesn't make luminosity. If you want your whites to glow, surround them with light values, and that's exactly what I've done here. I also picked a temperature dominance, and I chose to make it warm dominant. And then again, to get maximum impact out of the warmth, it's a good idea to throw in just a little bit of cool so people have some basis of comparison. If it's all warm, it can be like all dessert. So we need about 80% dessert, but then we need about 20% broccoli in there, just so we really appreciate how good the dessert is. So that's what these purple passages are, and the rest is warm. Now, to start the process, um, I, d I cheated a little bit, and I did some drawing here ahead of time, because I envisioned where I wanted this to go, uh, because you realize I'm under tremendous pressure here, standing up in front of all of you. And so I'm hedging my bets a little bit with a little bit of a, of a, a drawing, so I have a little bit of a structure. And then what I decided to do at this stage is protect a few of the areas that I think it's absolutely essential that remain white or light. And I want to protect those right up until the end. That doesn't mean they're necessarily going to remain white, but to start with, I want to make sure that I don't inadvertently go in and cover up some of these areas with the dark. And that's what you see here. I think you can, sure you can. You can see that, the, the color of the masking tape there. Um, I do a lot of masking, and I try to avoid masking fluid whenever possible because I don't like the look of the mark that it leaves on the page. I think it's too assertive, and I, I prefer masking tape. People ask me, what kind of tape do I recommend? And I always tell them 3M. <laughs> and then out of, out of state, people look at you like, what's 3M? And you have to explain Minnesota mining and manufacturing. But um, hardware store or lumber yard two inch tape is the product you want. It has a lot of stickum on it, so it does what it's supposed to do. It adheres well to the paper. Now, if you paint on a soft paper, 
like Fabriano or, or Wattman's, you're going to have trouble with this hardware store tape because you go to pull the tape off and you can very likely pull the surface of the paper off too. So to make sure that that doesn't happen, I also use Arches paper. Arches paper is virtually bulletproof and I know that I can tape and pull tape off and it will hold up very well to that tape. So this is the tape I use and I use another non-art tool. Um, anytime I can go to the hardware store instead of the art store, I do it because it's a lot cheaper. So here's a, here's a hardware store tool that I find indispensable. It's called a snap cutter. And what it is is a little handle. The, the newer ones are plastic. And it has a blade that slides in and out. And the blade is serrated. These come from wallpaper people originally. But they're wonderful because when the blade starts to get dull on the point, there's a little slot in the handle of the blade. And you insert the blade into the slot and then you give it a snap and the blade is serrated and now you have a brand new tip. You can get the plastic ones if, if you watch, uh, you can get them at Ace Hardware Store for 69 cents. And after about a year when you've worn the blade down to nothing, you go back to Ace Hardware and right next to the snap cutters for about $1.29 you can get three new blades and you're good for the next five years. So. <laughs> With the masking tape in place and my snap cutter, I'm going to cut out a shape. And one of the things I like very much about this masking tape is I can see through it. I can see my pencil lines under there. And what that means is that I could cut some, some very intricate stencils if I chose to. I'm keeping it fairly simple here. But know that you could get quite complex and quite intricate with this tool. Now, people ask, uh, aren't you afraid that you're going to cut through the paper uh, with the knife? And the answer is no. Uh, the other advantage of the snap cutter is that the blade is very flexible. It's better than a X-Acto knife because X-Acto knives are a little bit rigid. The flexibility of this blade transmits a lot of information back to your hand. And you know right where the surface of the paper is. So you're not going to push too hard. Uh, and you, you'll actually feel the difference between the tape and the paper. The newer ones are plastic, and it has a blade that slides in and out. And the blade is serrated. These come from wallpaper people originally. But they're wonderful because when the blade starts to get dull on the point, there's a little slot in the handle of the blade and you insert the blade into the slot and then you give it a snap and the blade is serrated and now you have a brand new tip. You can get the plastic ones if, if you watch. Uh, you can get them at Ace Hardware Store for 69 cents. And after about a year when you've worn the blade down to nothing, you go back to Ace Hardware and right next to the snap cutters for about $1.29 you can get three new blades and you're good for the next five years. So. <laughs> With the masking tape in place and my snap cutter, I'm going to cut out a shape. And one of the things I like very much about this masking tape is I can see through it. I can see my pencil lines under there. And what that means is that I could cut some, some very intricate stencils if I chose to. I'm keeping it fairly simple here. But know that you could get quite complex and quite intricate with this tool. Now, people ask, uh, aren't you afraid that you're going to cut through the paper uh, with the knife? And the answer is no. Uh, the other advantage of the snap cutter is that the blade is very flexible. It's better than a X-Acto knife because X-Acto knives are a little bit rigid. The flexibility of this blade transmits a lot of information back to your hand. And you know right where the surface of the paper is. So you're not going to push too hard. Uh, and you, you'll actually feel the difference between the tape and the paper. And I, I always tell the story about <laughs> teaching a workshop. There were two ladies in the same workshop who, who actually cut right through their paper. And it's, a, it's the only time it's ever happened. 
But as the workshop progressed, we realized that there were other issues uh, involved there. So. <laughs> I don't want to emphasize that story too much because someone this week actually cut their paper. <laughs> I, I don't want to make them feel bad. All right. So I have created a white shape that I feel fulfills Ed Whitney's criteria of what is a good shape. The other thing that's fairly important, I think, about this shape is that it encompasses about a third of the page. Um, and that's generous because in the end, I know I'm going to encroach on this, but you also know that you can't get white back very easily. So be a little bit generous, um, and a third is, is a pretty workable ratio. So once you've established a white shape and you've surrounded it with a light value, the next thing I like to do is go in and establish a dark or a series of dark shapes. Now, it's very important that the white shape remain intact. The way I describe it is that if it were a maze and you introduce a mouse into this maze, the mouse should be able to run to all parts of the maze without having to jump over anything. Now, disregard the masking tape because that's going to come up. So this white shape is connected, it's unified. The reason you need to do that is white is the most powerful element we have if we split it up into two camps, they will become warring camps. And they'll fight for dominance, and eventually you'll have to kill one in favor of the other. Otherwise, you can create a painting that's chaotic because the whites are so powerful. So I have a passageway through the white. Now I'm going to start putting in some darks, and I know from experience that I don't need to unify the darks, I don't need to link the darks, because they're not as powerful as the white, and the eye will look for the dark. So if a dark comes in here, and then it continues over here, the eye will sort of follow it under the white and wait for it to emerge. And you will not make a chaotic composition by splitting up the darks in the same way you will the whites. So I'm going to have more than one white shape, and I think, again, going back to Whitney, an odd number is better than an even number. Whitney said, this and this is boring. This is predictable. This is symmetry. This is much more interesting. Two opposing one. This is drama. This is boring again, two against two. This is more interesting, three against two. So basically what he's saying is odd numbers are better than even numbers. So. Excuse me, you said more than one white shape. You meant more, more than, than one, one dark, dark shape, shape, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you ever tried using a blue painter's tape? Um, blue painter's tape is a wonderful product because it gives you, I think, uh, a little bit sharper edge. Um, and it is, it, it's quite sticky. It, it, it's all good, except you can't see through it. It's opaque. So if you have pencil lines and you need to go back in and cut and do some, the kind of stenciling effect that I did here, the blue tape will not work. Uh, there's blue tape and there's green tape. And like I say, I think there are improvements on the old uh, masking tape, but the fact that they're not transparent is, is a real disadvantage. It's color too. Don't you believe it's color? I mean, a blue on a white, that, how can you see the color that you're painting? Well, I can't answer that because I've never used it. <laughs> but I could see where it would, it would kind of throw off your, your sense. Um, even the tan color of the masking tape yeah. is something you have to, you have to allow for as you, as you look at your entire painting. Uh, sometimes this tan color of the tape is a perfect color for your painting. And I have done paintings and matted them and framed them and had them hanging on the wall and then went up and looked close and realized I'd left some masking tape in there. Because it, it looked so good. Um, and that's okay, except eventually the masking tape is going to turn yellow and, and, and get brittle. So sometimes what I've done is I've taken it apart, taken the tape off, tried to mix up a color just like the tape color and painted it back in. Never seems to work. 
All right. So now the time has come. I guess I have to stop talking and paint a little. Well, I won't stop talking, but I have to paint a little bit. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a dark shape here, and. This is where I'm going to realize the benefit of these areas that I have taped because I don't have to take time now to paint around every one of these pieces. Um, oh, in case you're wondering what this is going to be, um, this is a photograph that I took in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is a wonderful town if you ever get a chance to go there. It's where uh, the movie The Perfect Storm was filmed, all of the land parts, uh, and it has a very viable uh, fishing community with a lot of wonderful boats, and it's a real harbor. It's not a make-believe harbor like a lot of them are on the East Coast. It's a working harbor, and I took a photo of this scene here, which I like very, very much, and I used it as a basis for some paintings, um, not to try and reproduce it exactly as it is, because I've got that here already, but to take some of the elements from it. And the elements that I'm interested in are this boat in the background, this pier or this dock coming out at you um, that kind of wraps around so it comes into the picture and then it takes a left. And then we have some smaller boats here in the foreground. So those are the elements that I'm going to try to incorporate. But at this point, we're still thinking abstractly. For my dark color here, I'm using one of my favorites which is alizarin, crimson, and phthalo green. I like it because it gives me a rich dark that I can control. Uh, if I go a little heavy on the phthalo, I can make it a cool gray, phthalo being green. If I wanted to make it a bit warmer, I'll go a little bit heavier on the alizarin the alizarin being on the red side. If I get it just exactly in between, I will end up with a neutral dark. And that's all you can say about it is that it's dark. And sometimes you want a dark that doesn't exhibit particular characteristics. Not particularly, I, well, I like to think I'm choosing to put the dark there because of how it relates to the light shape and the surrounding shape. I'm still thinking um, that, that my, uh, my primary obligation at this point is to make an interesting abstract pattern, an abstract uh, composition based on the relationship of dark, light, and medium values. You said something earlier about cheating a bit by sketching. Do you not usually sketch? Oh, I, I, I draw obsessively. Um, <laughs> but sometimes when you, when you do uh, something in, in, in a public forum like this, people want to see the whole process right from beginning to end. And uh, we are limited on time. And, and, and quite frankly, um, I know from experience, from watching demos and from giving demos, that you can stand up here and say all kinds of profound, wonderful things to people, and uh, at the end of the night, if the painting tanks, you might as well have been talking to yourself the whole night. So, I, I, w When I say cheating, I, I think what I really mean is I'm trying to hedge my bets a little bit here, and, and, and maybe increase the odds for success but I guess that'll that'll be uh, that'll be your determination eventually <laughs> ultimately here all right so I've got a dark shape now that's coming in here it's quite broken up by these pieces of tape but that's that's intentional um, then I think I'm going to continue it down here but I have Red and green on my brush. I've got a big puddle on my palette. I've got some of it on my paper now. Logically, it would seem that the thing to do would be just keep going. I, you know, I want more dark. I've already got it dark. 
so let's continue to use the dark. But Whitney was fond of saying that predictable is boring. So once you establish the concept of a dark made with red and green, it's a good idea to change that up. Give people a little surprise and go to a different combination to get dark. So I'll go to my second favorite, ultramarine blue. And here you have an option. You can either mix it with burnt sienna, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. And I know these are the two, probably the two widely, most widely used combinations to create darks. Um, when you add ultramarine blue to burnt sienna, there's red in the ultramarine blue, there's red in the burnt sienna, so you can get a purpley, is that a, is that a word? A gray, a neutral, that leans toward violet. If you add burnt umber to the ultramarine blue, you get a colder uh, gray that does, that does not have that red component. I kind of like that, that purple uh, aspect to it. Now, as I am putting in these darks, I am also back painting around objects that are that are going to constitute this pier, this dock. Um, so I'm painting positive posts, and the tape will represent negative shapes that will also look like posts. So as watercolorists, we have to be thinking both positively and negatively the whole time we're working. And that's very difficult to do sometimes. That's a lot to keep track of. And uh, I made a determination over the years that watercolorists are of superior intelligence to oil painters and acrylic painters, and we're able, to, we're able to handle these challenges. I think that's right, don't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so that all of my darks are not concentrated in the same part of the painting, I'm going to reintroduce bit of it over here. Also again, back painting around uh, shapes that I know I will use as the painting here progresses. So that, that's also uh, a nice benefit of, of, of having a drawing. Now I have, if, if you think of this as, as a single shape, I realize it's quite fractured at this point, but if this is a, is a dark incursion here, here's another one down here. Let's go for a third one, and I think we'll we'll let that occur over here. Now sometimes it's hard to know where you want a shape to end. So a good thing to do in that instance is to just let it sort of fade to nothing. And that way you just sort of avoid the problem. <laughs> if I'm not sure where I want that to end, I'll just let it sort of bleed out. And then, uh, then, I, don't, then I don't have to deal with that. All right, so I now have a white shape surrounded with a light middle value, and I have introduced some darks into, this, into the scenario, and I think that compositionally now, I've created a foundation. Uh, I've created a skeleton that I can use to build the rest of the painting on. And if I'm happy with the positioning of these shapes, these light shapes, light value shapes, darker shapes, now I'm getting into some middle value shapes, um, then I know that the painting process will almost be like frosting the cake. And if the, if the cake itself is substantial, it's not going to collapse under the weight of the frosting. And then you can be very creative and do whatever you want to do with the frosting. 
knowing that the cake is gonna is gonna survive the process. So uh, I'm I'm comfortable with that. Um, let me show you something right now because the time seems to be right. Um, I use Stephen Quiller paints because Stephen Quiller is a good friend. And uh, when they asked, when Jack Richardson asked Steve if he would be interested in having a line of paints named after him, Steve said, of course. He said, but you know, Jack, he said, I've got to be perfectly honest with you. I've tried them all, and I don't think there's a bit of difference between any of them. And I agree. But Steve, Stephen Quiller paints seem to granulate well because the company that makes them uses stone wheels to grind the pigment instead of stainless steel like all the modern companies and as a result the, the, the pigment is a little more coarse and a little heavier and it granulates better and for those of you uh, that aren't familiar with that term it's, it, it's a little pattern of little dots in the surface of the wash that kind of enhance the surface so here's how you can encourage granulation you can tilt the painting this way and I'm looking at this area up here now wash starts to slide then you can tilt it, let it slide back, and then tilt it this way and tilt it that way. You can watch it slide back and forth. And as it moves across the surface, the heavy pigment gets caught in the tooth of the paper, and it sticks. And you get this little textured effect, which I find quite attractive. Someone in a workshop showed me this trick, another way to increase granulation. So all week long, that's what we've been listening to in the workshop. <laughs> Basically, you're physically knocking the, uh, the paint down. Now, I got uh, wet going in a dry here, so I got a little, a little uh, blossom on the edge, which I think might interfere with the image that I'm trying to create. So I'll just go and touch that again. What texture paper are you using? I'm using Arches 140 pound cold press. Um, I got a merchandise award one time of uh, 25 sheets of, of 300 pound paper. So the next uh, 25 paintings I did were on 300 pound paper and I liked it. But when that was gone and I had to go to the store and pay the money out of my own pocket, I came to the realization that 140 pound paper is wonderful paper. <laughs> All right. Now, I have, as I said, I've, I've laid the foundation. I've got all the pieces in place. Now's the time that I'm going to start thinking a little more representationally I'm going to start thinking a little more about how I can convey a specific subject, a picture of something specific, as opposed to abstract shapes. I want to end up with a picture now that looks like a harbor and looks like boats and stuff like that. But uh, I'm fairly confident that my under, under painting abstract is going, to, is going to work for me. So let's see if it really does. Now. Sometimes we fall victim to our own palettes, and when we get a palette loaded up with color and paint, uh, it's just, well, it's laziness is what it is. You want to keep using it, and sometimes that works to our detriment. So I'm going to come up with some different combinations of color. I'm going to use a little, uh, I think it's gamboge, uh, a little more burnt sienna, and then I'll get a little phthalo green going there. Um, I, if you'll, I don't know if you can see this very well in the mirror, but I only have one green on my palette, and that's phthalo green, which is a very cold green. I can make sap green out of phthalo green. I can make all the, uh, the, the yellow greens, the pea greens, uh, if I need to, by adding various shades of blue to phthalo. So it's a very uh, versatile color. I can't make phthalo out of sap green. Phthalo being a cold green. So I feel that, that this is the only green that I need. And I'm, I must say I'm always a little surprised at the numbers of people I encounter in workshops that don't have phthalo green on their palette. It's a very utilitarian color. It, it really can wonderfully in all, the, in all the capacities that you need green to do. So what I'm going to do now...
start putting in some shapes that I hope will begin to look a little more representational, a little more like something instead of just abstract shapes. And in this case, I'm hoping that when it's done, it'll look kind of like a boat. I want to get a little difference between the hull and the superstructure of the boat, so I'm going to put in a little bit of a, a purple. Purple tends to work pretty nicely with, uh, with greens. Still back painting around pilings and posts and all this kind of stuff. Um, thinking both negatively and positively at the, at the same time. But I think you can see the advantage now of having these pieces, some of them at least, uh, masked and protected because I don't have to be extremely careful painting around these areas because I know that they, they're saved. see what happens if I add a little blue back into this mix here just so that I'm not using the same color too long to perform too many functions and what are these things I'm painting now it's stuff that you see on boats <laughs> Sometimes if you do it confidently, you, you'll buy yourself credibility. with all this stuff that you see up on the top of these boats. It's, it's mostly, I think, navigational uh, stuff. But what it, it does for us as painters is gives us an opportunity to do some uh, line work, some calligraphy, some effects that can be very, very effective complements to the larger, more blocky shapes that we use to define buildings and structural things. And I'll do a little more of that kind of thing later, but for now I would just like to give a few of these shapes established here. Would you talk about what brushes you tend to use most? Yeah. <laughs> Pointed ones and square ones. Um, <laughs> now, when you read the art magazines, you, you, you will often read articles titled something like this. Um, the only five brushes you'll ever need to own. Or someone will uh, endorse a, a, you know, a, a line of brushes and say, these are absolutely the best brushes. If you use these brushes, um, you'll, you'll paint just like me. And uh, I think if you've ever bought into that and tried it, you know it's not true. Um, so what I say about brushes is, is find some brushes that work for you and then stick with them. And uh, what I have, uh, about 80% of my representational painting is done with this brush right here. Number four pointed brush. And I paint large, a lot of my paintings, the square ones are three feet by three feet, and I cover most of the surface with, with a mark this big. Um, when I was teaching, I had to, um, okay, now I think that uh, the next thing that I would like to tackle is the foreground. And I think what I would like to do there is use that as an opportunity to show you a simple way to create a wet reflective surface. So I'm still using my masking tape for the same reason, because it protects what has gone before. But this time, instead of creating shapes, negative shapes, 
I'm going to paint around or mask around the outside and protect everything that falls outside that shape. And as I said, hopefully you'll see why in just a moment. Okay, so this is, this is a shape that is meant to look sort of like the, the dock or the pier in the foreground here. Um, we'll let it go up there. So what you see here as open space now is the area that I'm going to paint. This is the opposite of what we're doing up here. These are negative shapes being protected. This is going to be a positive shape, and I'm just making a wall around it to protect the area immediately outside of it, and I'll show you why. Um, I want to make a reflection on the street. A reflection is different than a shadow. When you paint shadows, you determine where the light source is, and then you, you treat the middle of that light source as if it were a van. You run lines from the vanishing point to the object casting the shadow, and that determines the direction of the shadow. Depending on how low the light is, depending on where the light comes from, that shadow changes. And uh, they'll either be, if it's direct overhead lighting, it'll be a little puddle around your feet. If the light is low, coming from that way, it'll be a long shadow extending out that way. I mean, you can figure out how shadows work. But sometimes people confuse shadows with reflections. Reflections go straight up and down, always. And uh, that is a clear distinction that will define shadows from reflections in your painting. And when you paint a painting with reflections, you know, a, a, a cityscape, you're implying that it is either raining or is just finished raining, or the, the <coughs> something has happened to cause the, the streets to be wet. And if you put shadows in that painting, you might confuse the viewer because you're sending them a mixed message. You're telling them it's both a rainy day and a sunny day at the same time. Now, that can technically be the case, but for our purposes, we're creating an illusion of reality. So pick a system and then stick with it. So I'm going to say this is overcast and it is either raining or it is just rain, and I want this dock in the foreground to be shiny. So here's what you do. You wet the surface just with, with clear water and be generous. You don't want standing puddles, but you don't want it to, to dry out midway through the process either. Now, as I'm doing this, I have to think a little bit about what it is I am reflecting. If it's a reflection, it has to be a reflection of something. And I have a boat here that I haven't quite developed yet. You might be able to see a suggestion of the hull. Um, and it has a, a, a tall passage here. So I'm going to let that reflect down here. And then uh, some of this other stuff will reflect here but it'll all go straight up and down. And also in the process, I'm going to try to create a little spotlight effect in this part of the painting here. So, straight up and down. Now, as Ed Whitney said, predictable is boring. So I'm not going to rely too heavily on the same <coughs> width brush to make these stripes. And I'm not going to re depend too heavily on the same color. Um, I do have some vertical posts here that could be kind of picked up in the reflection. And 